Just need to switch over to the screen. Right, okay. Right, Revelation chapter 12 is a very interesting passage to me. And it is a great passage because it is one of those passages in Scripture which cover a very broad span in history. In fact, it covers the entirety of the New Testament period from the very end of the Old Testament all the way through in broad strokes, obviously, not in, not in tiny details, but in broad strokes, a snapshot of the entire Christian era right through to the final great conflict. And last time I preached I, over here, I was, of course, speaking about that final conflict in Revelation chapter 13. It's outlined there. So we're kind of taking a step back. If uh, last time I was here, we focused particularly on the, on the build-up to and the nature of that final conflict that will be between Christ and Satan and will involve the parties that have chosen allegiance either side. Today, what we're going to do is take a step back as it were, and get a macro picture of the whole sweep of time. But, but, what we're going to focus on in Revelation chapter 12 is the good news of the victory over, of Christ over Satan and the, the little recipe that is contained in this chapter. If you read it too fast, you might almost just completely miss it. You might just gloss right over the top of it. But there's a, there's a threefold recipe in this chapter that gives us the uh, means of overcoming the enemy and making sure or guaranteeing that we come out on the side of victory through that final crisis. So Revelation chapter 12, and I've entitled the message for this morning, Overcoming the Devil. And what you will find is that as you travel through Revelation chapter 12, it outlines spiritual powers that are at war with each other. These two great spiritual powers are, of course, Christ and Satan. And they, they maneuver and they play out against each other on planet Earth through human agencies. And you can identify those agencies historically as you unpack the chapter. So Revelation chapter 12, and you will find that in this chapter there, I've divided it into sort of six snapshots, six Kodak moments, um, six sections that I'll just run through very quickly. We're not focusing on all of these, so I'm not going to focus on all of them. The first one that you'll find, scene one, is the arrival of the Messiah, and you'll find that here in verses one and two. It says, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. So here is a woman. A woman is a symbol of a church, of the people of God. Husbands, love your wives like Christ has loved the church. All the way through Old and New Testament, Jerusalem, Zion, Israel is compared to a delicate and comely woman. A pure woman represents a pure church in God. The people of God trusting in, in God in all their purity. And then, of course, in the book of Revelation, you will find an impure woman, a harlot, chapter 17, a, 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 a people of God claiming the privileges the rights, the names of God, but in apostasy, having turned against God while keeping the forms of godliness. So here is a pure woman. Everything around her is a symbol of light, stars, sun, moon. This is a pure woman, the true church. And she is being with child. She cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. The one she gives birth to, you'll find down here in verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. That you'll find later on in the book of Revelation and in the Old Testament is messianic language. So here is the true church. This is the end of the Old Testament time period. And the Messiah is about to come forth to be born. And so he's coming into the world. Snapshot number two, scene number two, after the arrival of the Messiah starts in verse three, where you will find the attempted overthrow of the Messiah right there as he's coming into the world, before he can even get his feet on the ground, before he can succeed at his mission, before Jesus can accomplish the goal for which he has come, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And when you parallel that, when you parallel that with verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. And how many did he take with him? He took a third. The angels were cast to the earth with him. 
So in both these passages, the stars here are a symbol, a third of the stars, a symbol of a third of the angels, side with Satan. They are drawn to the earth and they stand ready to take out the Messiah before he is even able to accomplish his mission. Of course, of course, the Messiah succeeds, and you have that just in one snapshot here where it says, after the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour the child as soon as it was born, she bore a male child, verse 5, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God into his throne. Does the enemy succeed? No, he does not succeed. He does not succeed. The Messiah comes into the world. He accomplishes his mission. He's, he, he pays the price of death. We'll see that in a little while. And then he's resurrected, caught up to God and to his throne where he is inaugurated. And you'll find that snapshot in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. The inauguration of Christ after his ascension to heaven is pictured in Revelation 4 and 5 where the, 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 the authority of the ruler of this world, Satan, is stripped away from him and given to Christ. But we'll touch on that again in a little while. Verse 6, then the woman flees into the wilderness. This is scene 3, scene 3 out of the 6 here in Revelation chapter 12. The woman, a symbol of the church, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now, this carries on in verse 13. So we're going to skip over a section and come back to it in a moment. But verse 13 says, When the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. The woman was given two wings like a great eagle, that she may fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood water. Revelation 17, verse 15. The, the waters represent peoples, nations, multitudes. So here the dragon summons his, his team, his earthly team, and they go out to hunt down this true church that has fled into the wilderness to be protected by God. That imagery of the wilderness, of course, to an Israelite mind is a great image because it, it harkens back to the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. God took his people oppressed by slavery, threatening to be murdered and made extinct in the hands of the Egyptians, these unbelievers. And he delivers them from the hands of the Egyptians and he takes them into the wilderness where he nourishes them, where he builds them, where he establishes them as a nation. And so here is this picture now in the New Testament time period of a church after the birth of Christ, that's how we know it's New Testament, where it will face persecution from the dragon. A specific time period is given, time, times, and half a time, and that takes us back to Daniel chapter 7, where the little horn, a symbol of the Roman Catholic power during the Middle Ages, the little horn persecutes the people of God for time, times, and half a time. And the time, times, and half a time stand in parallel to verse 6, which is 1,260 days. So when you take that idea of 1,260 days, a symbolic time period in prophecy, you read Numbers 14, verse 34, you read Ezekiel 4, verse 6, you discover that time periods in prophecy are symbolic. A day equals a year. 1,260 days is 1,260 years. And this is a time period after the birth of the Messiah. It's what we call the Middle Ages or the dark ages where the church of God the one claiming to be the church of God this Roman Catholic power the little horn of Daniel 7 the one through whom the dragon works in this little section here stands up proclaiming to be the church of God but does not stand for the truth and the righteousness of God and those who stand up on the word of God to to seek reform to seek change to seek to follow God according to the dictates of their conscience and the truth of the word they are persecuted and hunted and they are forced to flee into the wilderness but God in the symbolism of the wilderness, covenants to take care of his people. Though she is harassed, though the enemy has turned his ire and his hatred onto the church, God's promises, just like with Israel of old, I will take her into the wilderness. I will protect her. And that's what happens here when, he, when, 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 the, when the, the um, serpent opens his mouth, a flood of water goes out to sweep the woman away, to destroy her. Verse 16 says, the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So that's the third scene, but it's interrupted. It's interrupted by scene 4 and 5, which is where we want to focus this morning. Scene 4 is verses 7 to 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was 
a place found for them in heaven any longer. So that great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Scene four is the, the beginning of the cosmic conflict, this conflict that we have seen being outlined here. When the Messiah comes, this conflict on earth, the, the church of the Middle Ages, the, the true church being persecuted by the one that claims to be the true church, but which God distances himself from and says, no, that's not my church. And then right in the middle of this whole thing, it's like, whoa, hold on, stop a second. Let's take a step back and see where it all began. And where did the conflict begin? On earth? No. In the Garden of Eden? No. It began some time before that. Where? In the presence of God in heaven. We'll come back to that in a moment. Scene five is verses 10 to 12. It says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation, strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Scene five in this chapter here is the decisive victory in the conflict. The conflict which begins in heaven, the decisive victory is gained by Christ on earth. And this is the section we're going to focus on in just a moment. And then scene six is verse 17, just one verse. After the whole thing about the Middle Ages, what will happen? Will, will, Christ, will, will Satan win? Will he overcome the church? Will he eradicate truth and righteousness? Will he get rid of the biblical teaching? No. Verse 17 comes along and says, The dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. There were survivors. The old King James says the remnant of her seed, the leftovers of that pure church down through the ages, though the mainstream church apostatized, claiming to stand in the place of God, to teach on behalf of God, even to persecute in the name of God. God says, no, that's not my church. I distance myself. If you've ever met people who say, I want nothing to do with God or Christianity because of what's been done in the name of God. Study the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation because in there you will find the answer to that. God himself says, I know what's going to happen in advance. I know this is going to happen. There's this, this church is going to stand up, claim to be acting in my name, claim to be the head of Christianity. But I distance myself from it. It is not acting in the spirit of Christ, but with the persecuting intolerant nature of Satan, the dragon, the dragon. I want nothing to do with God and Christianity because of what's been done in the name of God. Yes, they said it was in the name of God, but God, before it even happened, said, it's not being done in my name. It's done in the spirit and the power of the dragon. Don't write God off because of what the church does. Don't write God off because of what happened in the past in the name of God in the church. Satan's masterpiece in the last days has been to hijack Christianity. It has been for Satan to become a Christian, to walk into the church, to take the church over, the church of the Middle Ages, keeping the names and the forms of Christianity, misrepresenting the true character of God. But there will be survivors Scene six, the dragon was enraged with the woman. Why? Because he lost again. And so what does he do? He turns from this New Testament church to what's left. There's something it's, it's related to, but in the language of it, somewhat separate to at the same time. It's the remnants, the leftovers of the true church who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And again, we're not going to focus on that. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. 
pictures the scene that I want to paint in your mind this morning. Scene 5 out of these 6 here. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. And it says the following. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Has been cast down. Now notice that this scene five here begins with the word what? Now. Now salvation has come. Now, we need to ascertain two things here. What is this time period? What, what is this now salvation has come? And we need to ascertain what is the story about an accuser? Who is the accuser? What is the accuser? What he, who is he accusing and what is he accusing of? So I want you to turn with me to Zechariah chapter 3 for a moment. Second last Old Testament book, Zechariah chapter 3. And you'll find a very insightful story. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Sorry, from verses 1 to 5. And it says the following. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Who is the angel of the Lord? It is Jesus. You notice your Bibles will have that capitalized. The angel of the Lord. This is not to say that Jesus is an angel. It is to say that he leads the angel. He is the angel of the Lord. And in fact, in the Greek, angel simply means messenger. Jesus is the chief messenger for God. Hebrews kind of conveys this idea where it says, you know, down through the ages, God has spoken to us through the prophets. But in these last days, he has sent his own son, Jesus, the chief messenger. The one who is what God is, entirely and completely, totally and absolutely divine, and yet is the messenger, the spokesperson for God. Does that make sense? So when we talk about the angel of the Lord, we're not demoting Jesus. We're saying he's fulfilling a certain role. He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan, where? Standing at his right hand, to what? Oppose him. Now this is interesting. In Revelation chapter 12, the devil is called what? The devil and Satan. Do you know what the name devil means? What does it mean? Almost. The devil means slanderer. The one who spreads lies. The one, who, the one who, who, who tells stories that aren't true with the intent of maligning character. The devil. Satan means the adversary. That's why the serpent is called the devil and Satan. Because he's a liar, a slanderer, and he stands to oppose God and his people. And here you have this picture. You have Satan, meaning the, the, the adversary, standing to oppose to oppose who? To oppose God's man and to oppose God himself. He stands there to oppose the angel of the Lord and he stands there to oppose Joshua the high priest. Now here's a question for you. What did the high priest in the Old Testament signify? Who did it point forward to in the New Testament? Jesus Christ, right? That's the book of Hebrews. Jesus is our great high priest. Okay, so Joshua is a symbol of Jesus in a sense. Who did the, who did the high priest represent? Yes, Jesus in the absolute sense, but in the, in the days of the high priest and his ministry, who did he represent? He represented the people to God, and he represented God to the people. Are you with me? His, the way he dressed, the clothes he had on, all of that was symbolic. The work that he did, the carrying of the sin that he had to perform, the ministry of atonement, all of that stuff was a symbol of what God would do for the people. But the high priest, and Hebrews makes this painfully clear, what qualifies Jesus to be our high priest is the fact that he's not only God, but that God has become man so that he is well and able and truly carrying humanity into the courts of heaven. That's why the New Testament teaches that we are already seated in the place of God's throne room. We are already there. Why? 
Because everyone who is in Christ, and Christ is the, the, the archetypical human being, if you like. He represents every human being because he is a human being. He has already succeeded and is already seated there at the right hand of power. So humanity has already made it to heaven. The rest of us just have to catch up. Does that make sense? So the high priest represented God to the people and the people to God. He was the coming together, the unifying, the reunion, the reconciliation between God and the people. So here Satan stands ready to oppose him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. What does this mean? The symbol's about to be explained. Verse 4. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. What are clothes a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Righteousness. Torn, dirty clothes are a symbol of our sinfulness, our loss of righteousness. And being clothed in the perfect garment of Christ is a symbol of receiving His perfect righteousness. So what makes Joshua acceptable is that he has found salvation in God. God provides His righteousness and silences the accuser. Are you seeing a parallel in themes? He silences the accuser, this representative of humanity, who Satan is saying, you can't have him. He's mine. He belongs to me. Look at what he's wearing. Filthy robes, unrighteous acts, sinfulness. He is just completely corrupt. He looks like me. He's my boy. He's not your boy. And Jesus says, Satan, just be quiet. Just be quiet. Step aside, because I am going to give him my own righteousness. I am going to make him my child by clothing him in my righteousness. And at the end of the story, the accuser of the brethren is silenced. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. So here's the question. When did salvation come? When was the accuser cast down? When did that happen? When did this thing that, that, that is figuratively illustrated, prophetically illustrated in the book of, of Zechariah about Joshua, when did, that, when did that meet its fulfillment? At the cross, right? At the cross. Take a look at this language. We find it in John chapter 12. It's Jesus who's speaking here. And he's speaking about his death. And he says, now is the judgment of... When, when's the judgment of this world? At the end, is that the judgment of the world? No, when was the world judged? At the cross. At the cross. Now is the judgment of the world. Now the ruler of this world will be what? Cast out. When was Satan once and for all cast out? Was it the cosmic battle in the beginning? Was it this, this great scene we saw of the war in heaven where he was cast down to the earth? Is that when he was cast out once and for all and finally? No, it wasn't. He was simply the battle moved from heaven to earth. The battle moved from heaven to earth. Does that make sense to you? He was cast from heaven to earth. Why was he cast to earth? Because we were the dimwits that voted for him. Does that make sense? We welcomed him. We adopted his principle. We rebelled against God in the same spirit that he rebelled against God. We were deceived by him. We voted for him. And so therefore, he took possession of this place. Why? Because God made this place and entrusted it to the care of humanity, gave us the freedom of choice to choose between God and Satan. We chose Satan. And God honored our freedom of choice by allowing Satan to be exiled to this earth from heaven where he had been rejected and lost the initial battle because we welcomed him. We provided for him political asylum when no one else was dumb enough to do that. 
And so the battle shifted from heaven to earth. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. The devil and his angels fought. There was no more place found for the devil and his angels. And so he was cast with his angels to the earth. That wasn't the final casting out of Satan. Why? Because he still operates as the accuser. And we know from the book of Job that Satan still in some way had some degree of access to heaven. Because when there is this grand celestial meeting of, of the sons of God, Satan presents himself. Job chapter 1 and 2, by the way. And God says to him, excuse me, what are you doing here? What right do you have to be here? And, and Satan says something interesting. He says, oh, I come from roaming to and fro across the earth. What was he saying? I go where I please because earth is mine. I represent it. I am the God of that world. No one has jurisdiction over me. I own that little space. You're calling a celestial meeting of governors while I am presenting myself as humanity's representative. And God turns around to him and says, Now, Satan, have you considered that that place is not ruled entirely by you? What do you mean? Have you considered my servant Job? An upright, an upstanding man. He does not go along with your system of governance. He, re he rejects you entirely. You claim to be the ruler of this world. I'm telling you, Satan, you have usurped my rightful position. And what does Satan do? He does what he does. He accuses. Job serves you simply because you're his sugar daddy. You give him everything he wants. He serves you for the blessings, not for your character. Fine, take it all away. Take it all away, one by one by one. The blessings of God are taken away. This is the work of the enemy. He stands ready to accuse, to accuse God of dealing unjustly, unfaithfully, to accuse humanity of being unworthy. The accuser of the brethren. He was cast out of heaven to earth in the beginning of the conflict. But the conflict had to play itself out down here. And it wasn't until the cross that Satan was once and for all cast down. Jesus goes on to say, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And the rest of the verse not quoted there says, this he said, signifying the manner of death he was going to die. He's talking about the cross and he says, now this world will be judged at the cross. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Why? Why is the cross the place where the ruler of this world is cast out? Because at the cross, the questions are once and for all answered. Satan, the accuser of the brethren, has leveled accusations against the character of God. It was a philosophical, spiritual, theological war, if you like, in heaven that he eventually lost. It was the question of, is God a good God? Is he trustworthy? Does he rule for the benefit of his creatures? Or is he simply power hungry? Is he withholding from humanity that which, and from the angels, that which is good for them? And we see this, this whole concept echoed in the, in the discussion between between. Satan and Eve there at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does he say? Has God really said this? Are you serious? God has really said, he's actually withholding something from you? Yes, because it's for our good. You see, the day we eat of it, we will separate from God and we will suffer the consequence of death. No, 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 no. No, you don't understand. The reason God has said don't eat from this tree is not because you will die in separation from God. He's not trying to protect your life. He's trying to prevent you from becoming what he is. He knows the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like him. Now that's an, amazing, that's an amazing little segment of language there. Because when you study Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, which describes the fall of Lucifer from heaven, you will find that this was his downfall. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. I will take the place of God. I will stand in his place. And what does he infuse humanity with? The same doubt about the character of God, the same questionings about whether God is truly good and loving and kind and trustworthy, about whether God has our interests at heart or whether he's just selfish and serving him, his own purposes and agenda. He says that to Eve. He plants the seed. It goes around for a little while. And she says, what if he's right? And she doubts the character of God. She reaches out. She plucks the fruit. She eats it. And here we are wasn't about the fruit. 
it was the accuser of the brethren accusing God to the people and accusing the people to God. And the moment Adam and Eve fell in transgression, he had political asylum on planet Earth. This became his juris jurisdiction through the exercise of our free choice. And the conflict would rage on. The heavenly intelligences made their choice. A third sided with him and were removed. The two thirds remained with God. But we gave him home. We gave him asylum. And all the way down through the ages, the questions lingered. The echo of the questions lingered. Is God love? Is God grace? Is God mercy? Is God unselfish? Is God good? Or is he bad? Unanswered questions. 